Okay, we're going to get started. There's still a number of people joining us today for our session, but we're just going to get it kicked off. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Tech Talk. Tech Talk is a webinar series hosted by ChemPoint. This is your host, Mark Friedel. Today will be the second in the Tech Talk webinar series. The content of Tech Talk webinars is intended to be informational on subjects that are most important in our industry, focusing on innovative future trends with influential guest speakers and industry thought leaders. The recording of today's webinar and all of our webinars will be posted on YouTube. For those watching this as a recording on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button, ring the notification bell, and smash the like button. Today, October 28th, 2020, we will focus on data and how to use data for a superior planning in your business. This is clearly a hot topic as we have a lot of people interested in attending the session today. I'm glad the topic is resonating with the industry. As the commercial director for ChemPoint and a 20 year member of the team, I will be your host and moderator. My co-host is Mr. Sean Seibel, who has spent two plus decades working for major producers in our industry. Sean will walk us through today's content. We will also be joined by two, member, two members of ChemPoint's data analytics team. Um, I like to call them the industry's best kept secrets. First, we have Lee Dirks. Lee has spent 15 years as a data analytics and business intelligence professional, working for companies such as Sandia Labs and Nordstrom. Also, Jeff Anderson will be joining the discussion today. Jeff is a seven year member of the ChemPoint team and an experienced data analyst with a strong knowledge of data visualization, machine learning, and of course, data analysis. Lee and Jeff will be key contributors to answering questions at the end. Lastly, we are joined by my friend and ChemPoint Global Leader, Rick Honer, for a few opening comments. So with that, Rick, do you have any opening comments for us? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining today. Um, as Mark said, today's topic has no shortage of content, uh, marketing, and media coverage. And that's both positive and negative. So we appreciate the opportunity to discuss a very relevant and timely topic around data and analytics. You know, I've worked at ChemPoint for 20 years now, and data has always been a core pillar to our business. And that's why I find today's webinar particularly interesting. I can also say that even with 20 years of data focus, I can tell you that technologies have shifted drastically and that ChemPoint is only scratching the surface from a capability standpoint. Most of the conversations I have in our industry about analytics are targeted at efficiencies in the supply chain, which is logical given the complexity of our producers' ecosystems. But also, as you know, there are many other business areas where you can target your analytics programs. Regardless of where you decide to deploy the tools, um, I have some suggestions for you when you decide to roll out a program. The first is hire a good team. You know, you've got Lee and Jeff at ChemPoint. You need to make sure you have a team that has a background and understanding around how to build an analytics ecosystem, not just analytics period. Number two is start with your strategy. Build your overall or encompassing company strategy and then bring analytics in to support your key initiatives. Um, I think that's maybe primary to success from, from my experience. Um, and third is building a culture around analytics and, and an analytical approach to solve the problems um, that support uh, the rest of your business. And you know, in conjunction with that, you need an analytics team that has a support mindset that they're there to solve problems for the rest of the business. So, you know, the rest of the team will take you through a much more detailed review uh, and guidance uh, of use of analytics. But from my standpoint, focusing on those three key areas with whatever program you put into place will provide meaningful return on your investments. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Mark. Thanks, Rick. So we do have a couple of things to be aware of in our webinar session today. First, we have allotted 60 minutes and we'll reserve the last 15 to 20 minutes or so for Q&A. There is a Q&A button in Microsoft Teams. 
Um, this is how we will field questions. Uh, so please ask questions throughout the session. Um, don't just wait till the end. Feel free to ask your question as it comes to mind during the session. And at the end, uh, we will collect them. Uh, we will answer the questions at the end. So just ask as the session goes along. Um, uh, similar to the, the last webinar we did, uh, today's webinar is intended to be interactive. Uh, so in addition to the Q&A at the end, we will also have a handful of questions throughout the session. The questions are optional and intended to be light, intuitive, but hopefully it will also steer today's discussion. You will need your cell phone camera ready to participate in the questions. Alternatively, you can pull up a web browser and go to the website menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and that'll also allow you to answer the questions when they come up. Finally, similar to our previous webinar, uh, we use some ChemPoint examples to illustrate some of today's content. But again, please don't take the content of today's webinar to be a commercial on ChemPoint. We are rather exposing some of ChemPoint's tools as examples only, nothing else. The, the true intention of today's webinar is informational only. So before we get into it, we feel we need to set the stage on data, specifically what it is and why it's important. More and more companies are relying on data to make decisions. Instead of using human intuition and gut instincts that can oftentimes be inaccurate, we are relying more and more on data to drive decisions and take action. In 2018, over $27 billion was spent on data consulting services. These experienced resources can guide us in this very complex topic. To put data in perspective, it may be helpful to break it down into its most basic elements. Bits and bytes are the most basic elements of data. A byte is a string of eight zeros and ones or eight bits. A kilobyte is roughly a thousand bytes and is about the amount of information that can be stored on one of these oversized floppy disks that we may remember from the 1980s. Next, a megabyte is about the amount of information that can be stored on one of these three and a half inch floppy disks, which were popular in the 1990s. From there, we have a gigabyte, which is roughly the amount of data required to stream an episode of your favorite TV show on Netflix. Then we have a terabyte, which is about the amount of information that can be stored on a computer server or today's most powerful desktop computers. Next is a petabyte, which is on the order of information that is generated by Facebook daily. Now an exabyte is the order of information that Google has. To put exabytes into perspective, it is estimated that every word ever spoken by humans throughout history is roughly five exabytes if those words were stored as data. Next are zettabytes, which is on the order of all the data in the world. Finally, we have a yottabyte, which is such a large and absurd amount of data that it would require storage facilities with a footprint the size of the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined and cost $100 trillion. Now, as mentioned, today's webinar will be interactive. As such, we have come to our first interactive question. The question is geared towards the speed at which data is growing in our world. So the question is, how frequently does data double in the world? Now, get out your cell phone cameras, scan and hold, hold the camera up to that QR code um, on the slide you're seeing here. And if you're using an iPhone, it should automatically prompt you to go to a web, web browser to answer the question. Um, alternatively, you can go to the website menti.com, enter the, the code written here to answer the question. Um, it is a multiple choice question, but we'll still give everyone a few minutes or sorry, a, a, a few seconds to complete this. So I'll just pause and everyone take a few minutes to go and answer the question. OK, we're getting a few answers now. Um, it looks like the most popular answer is two years. Um, six months is also getting a handful of votes. Um, yeah, data is uh, definitely increasing at a very, very fast rate. 
So those are the real time responses. I'll get to the answer here in just one second. Um, it is no surprise that data is accelerating. As you can see from this chart, the total amount of data in the world was estimated at the beginning of the beginning of the year to be 44 zettabytes. So to answer the question, the estimates are that data is now doubling every two years. It looks like most of the people that responded um, were pretty spot on there. However, the speed of data is accelerating and all the data in the world is expected to reach 175 zettabytes by 2025. So it really appears a Yoda byte is not that far off. Now, people might ask, where is all this data coming from? It comes from many sources, but it can be put into a few major buckets. The first is transactional data, and I think this is what most people are familiar with. This is the type of data that has the largest amount of history, what we're familiar with, and it's transactional data from your customers that gets stored into your ERP system. Next, we have data that is generated from web searches and web browsing. All of those searches and clicks are being tracked and recorded um, from your favorite companies such as Google. Next, a, significant, a significantly growing amount of data is coming from social platforms. All the posts, pictures, and videos that we share with colleagues, friends, and families are creating a tremendous amount of data. Finally, the increasing number of gadgets and tools that are connected to the internet is, is collecting a lot of data as well. Our cars, thermostats, household appliances, lights, and many other things are generating massive amounts of data, which has the potential to explode in coming years. This is also referred to as the Internet of Things. Many different terms get thrown around when we have discussions around data, so we feel it's a good idea to define a few terms. Um, first, you'll hear the term data analytics. Data analytics is the process of taking data. Sometimes it might be called big data or unstructured data and really making sense of it through organized cleaning um, and modeling. It is the process that looks into the past um, and structures that data. Predictive analytics and machine learning use this data to extract knowledge and look at future trends and make predictions. In the case of machine learning, it does not require explicit programming to make these predictions from very large amounts of data where the algorithm can actually change, such as the, the machine or the computer is changing the code. Finally, artificial intelligence, deep learning and neural networks are more advanced uses of data. Artificial intelligence or AI is a computer system that uses data to make independent decisions similar to critical thinking in humans. Artificial intelligence can further be broken down into general AI, weak AI, and strong AI. Deep learning and neural networks are more advanced forms of artificial intelligence that mimics the brain to process multiple nonlinear inputs and outputs and form conclusions. These are obviously advanced discussions or advanced topics. Um, and if we'd like to get into these discussions, we've got our experts on the line so we can uh, field more questions around these more advanced topics. Now to highlight the power of data, we would like to go back um, to a story from Forbes magazine in 2012, um, just as an example of how data can be powerful and even sometimes a little bit scary. Target had a new data analytics program to better assist customers. From this program, they were able to pinpoint a teenage pregnancy before the teenager's father found out about it. Target had addressed coupons for baby products to the teenager based on the data they collected. The father was obviously upset when he saw the coupons and stormed into Target and demanded an apology and an explanation as to why Target is encouraging teen pregnancies. For those who remember this story, the father later found out the truth and went back to Target to apologize. So if you recently purchased cocoa butter lotion, a purse large enough to double as a diaper bag, zinc magnesium, and a bright blue rug, there's an 87% chance that you're pregnant with a delivery date in late February. Now for today's content, I will pass it to Sean, Mr. Sean Seibel. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Hello, everybody. Um, 
2020 has indeed been a year of transformation. With COVID-19 and when the year started, who would have thought that all of us would or most of us would be on lockdown at certain points and socially distancing throughout most of the year. Um, that has forced the, everyone in the world, including the chemical and ingredient industry, to change the way that we interact. We are now using digital to replace what would normally happen as face-to-face -face interactions or processes. Um, as a leader in digital marketing, et cetera, and data analytics in the chemical and ingredient industry, we've had a lot of suppliers, customers, et cetera, reach out and ask for input on that. So what ChemPoint decided to do was put together this series of webinars initially talking about digital marketing, data analytics, and just give an overview of things that we are aware of within the industry. And it's just meant to be Q&A for you or informative. So the first webinar we hosted was about seven weeks ago. It was focused on digital marketing. Um, and at the end of that, we emphasized that effective digital marketing actually generates a very significant amount of data. Today, we're going to talk about how to utilize that data for best practices to reduce your costs, optimize your price, etc. So in terms of data analytics, we're going to start off uh, to generate more effective marketing. Then we'll move into sales enablement then business planning. And finally, at the end, if you're going to invest, what is the return and what best practices do you need to put in place for that return? Mark? So again, in terms of practical applications, you start with digital marketing and you generate a significant amount of data. The first thing you can do with that data is improve your marketing function. We'll talk about what is called the marketing funnel in the digital world with a customer journey. We'll talk about personalization and how that trend, not just within chemical and ingredients industry, but B2, B2C type industries is really uh, taking off. And then other emerging trends that we see within data analytics and marketing. Regarding sales enablement, um, order pattern alerts. Help your salespeople be more effective. Don't just force them to go into your CRM system and your ERP system to dig out data and find out maybe a customer has missed some orders and that could cause some issues. Product recommendations in order for effective cross-selling um, can really generate extra revenue and profit relative to what you would traditionally consider. And then obviously pricing. What can you do besides download data into an Excel spreadsheet and manually massage that in order to optimize pricing? Then we're going to get into something that we call forecasting, which is demand forecasting in the short term. However, with the use of advanced digital and machine learning and then getting into the artificial intelligence aspect, you can start to play and automate with machines um, trying to correlate your business performance over the long term. And this is a new and emerging thing that's happening within our industry. Next. So we're going to start off with marketing. Much of this data is generated by marketing, so let's use it to improve marketing. Before we get into any details on this, the one thing that we want to put up front is that when it comes to data, data gathering, data storage and data analytics, there are a lot of third party applications that are recommended out there. This is just a list of the applications that ChemPoint uses. However, we're not trying to sell these companies or these applications. You could utilize other applications from others just as effectively. The trick is getting these applications to talk to each other in one way or another. So obviously when you talk about digital and the internet, Google stands out. Google has many different tools available that do different things. Google Analytics, their search console, ads and trends, and we will highlight some of the tools that we utilize in different parts of our data analytics. There are tools called Visible and Marketo that really help understand your email blasts and things like that. Microsoft Dynamics happens to be the CRM system that uh, ChemPoint is on. Power BI down below that is a Microsoft tool for data analysis and visualization. So because they're both Microsoft, they easily tie together. However, Power BI can be used with other CRM and ERP systems. So the takeaway here is you're going to invest in third party applications and your biggest challenge is going to be how to tie these applications together. Next. So when it comes to marketing, we start off with what we call the digital marketing funnel. And again, we had our first webinar focused on digital marketing about seven weeks ago, and it is posted on YouTube. 
When it comes to digital, um, there is a buying cycle, but we like to look at it as a customer journey. That is a Silicon Valley phrase that uh, just works really well within the world of digital sales and marketing. And the funnel starts at the top with what we call an impression. And an impression is when a person out in the world looking at the digital universe sees your brand in some way, shape or form, whether it's through an email or a Google search. And associated with your brand is a link that if they click on it, they will be taken to your landing page. And if they click on that link, they become a visitor. And if they stay within your page, explore around, find something they're interested in and want more information, they become a marketing lead. And the customer journey continues to go on and on and on until you have a certain number of wins that are transformed into actual customers. The takeaways here are that within the digital world, you should recognize that over on the far right, there is a high number of impressions that will be made out in the digital universe. But from the amount of impressions to the people who actually click on the link to visit your landing page, that's going to call the number down. And then those who want to reach out for more information and become a marketing lead will be even a smaller number. So that is what we call the marketing funnel. And the wide mouth starts at the top with the number of impressions, the people who see your brand working all the way down to getting into your site, finding information, wanting follow up, doing the work and then becoming an actual customer. So large to small. From a data analytics perspective, however, you need to shift over to the right as well and look at it in terms of percentage because the high number of impressions in an email blast, for example, and we talked about this in webinar one, email blasts are relatively low effectiveness relative or compared to something like search engine optimization because Google people do a lot of keyword searches on Google. So if you look at your percent click rate or click through rate as we call it, you're going to see a number that looks like it's pretty low. Actually, 2% is quite good in terms of a conversion rate. And then from there, once you get somebody to your site, well, they've already clicked because they think that there might be some interest. Well, if there's some initial interest, you have a higher probability of them becoming a marketing lead. And if they become a marketing lead and find something that they wanted more interest in, they'll ask for a sample with even higher probability and the probabilities continue to go up until you reach the point of customers. So from an analytical perspective, trying to improve your marketing, it starts with the marketing funnel. Next. And here we're gonna talk about how to analyze your marketing activities to maximize the return or maximize the percent click-through rates in your marketing funnel. So for example, everyone is familiar with email blasts, but Although you are sending emails out to a large number of people, are you actually analyzing the data behind that to find out who actually saw it, who clicked on it, and then became an opportunity? So there are third party tools such as Marketo. Um, Marketo as a tool actually integrates into your CRM and ERP system. And you can figure out that this is just an example of one of ChemPoint's email marketing campaigns. Um, we sent over 2,000 emails. Over on the right, if you look at bounces, that's the number of emails that came back, invalid address or something else happened. Okay, so that was just less than 10%. But the important point for us is that if we look down below, that means that we had almost 94.3% of emails delivered. Um, the click-through rate to open them up, you know, 186, 9.3%, and then to actually click on that link to come to our landing page, 4.6%. The type of data that you're looking at here from a marketing perspective helps you understand what keywords resonated with the people that you sent that information to or that email to. You can break it down into market segmentation because you know who opened it and who clicked in. That data is re readily collected during this whole process. So you can refine future email blasts, figure out what keywords resonate more than others and any type of pictures or things like that. Next. Search engine optimization data and results. This is just going to be very quick. In the first webinar, we talked about search engine optimization as being the leading digital marketing tool that you have in your portfolio today. Uh, keyword searches on Google are dragging or bringing more website traffic than any other marketing tool available. 
However, all of that traffic is tracked by Google and Bing, and you can download that data to your website or utilize another in site or application called Ahrefs that will give you information or insights to other people's websites. You can actually see what traffic is being driven through different keyword searches to other people as well. This is just an example of thickening and binding cleansers and hand sanitizers with ChemPoint. Um, you're looking at the top there, the chart over time, thickeners for hand sanitizers. Okay, not a lot of keyword searches. A lot of people understood what was out there and it was not a high you know, demand industry until March and April of 2020 due to COVID when all of a sudden people were searching and scrambling to find hand or thickeners for hand sanitizers and other ingredients. What you're looking at here is from a digital marketing perspective. The purple line is total impressions. And again, that's the number of people that see your brand with a link that they could potentially click. And then in the blue is the number of actual clicks to get them to your landing page. So you can go in and track this and again, utilize this information to further refine future marketing campaigns based on what keywords actually worked because you're doing this based on keyword searches and Google will tell you what keywords generated this data. Next. Marketing personalization is something that is taking off within the industry, the chemical and ingredient industry right now. Um, it has already taken off on a B2C context, and this is the example that we will use um, on the right side. Personalize your website so that you can give people an idea of other options that they can explore based on what they're already looking at. So this is just an Amazon example. It resonates with everybody around the world. Somebody looks for a bicycle for children. Well, Amazon puts in place down below, hey, you have other options with bicycles. If this is the type that you're looking for, these other types might be something to consider. At the same time, it's a child's bike. You know, a child should be wearing a bike helmet and maybe require knee pads. So the point of personalization is to narrow down the options while still giving options out to the people who are doing the search. Otherwise, they would have to crawl through the entire set of landing or websites to, in order to find that type of information. Next. That was a B2C example based on Amazon. It makes it easy for everyone to understand the concept of personalization, but how do we apply that within uh, the chemical and ingredient industry? It's something that is just starting out. Um, and what we're showing here is an example from ChemPoint. Uh, it's something that we just put together and we'll be implementing internally here in the near future. But if someone goes in and searches a particular product line or an application area, what we try to do is give them say, hey, you're searching for a particular thing, there are other options out there. And what we're trying to do is make it easier for you to look at certain options without having to go through our entire website, looking at different products in order to find something because you could easily miss it that way. So it just simplifies it for the customer um, while still giving them a range of options. Next, a Google search trend example. And this is where understanding what keyword searches are happening out in the world and Google readily provides this information as well as some other third party sites as well. So with the area of with the era of COVID in 2020, what we're going to do is show you some non chemical and ingredient um, examples here to make it understandable and then we'll pull it in and show the significance of this within the chemical and ingredient industry. What you are looking at is traffic to the United Airlines website based on keyword searches. So prior to COVID in February and March of 2020, there was you know reasonable number of keyword searches to go to United. Then in February to March of 2020, as the world went on lockdown, there was a huge spike because a lot of people had been traveling and needed to get home. And then once they were home, everybody was staying home under lockdown. So there was a huge decrease in keyword searches for United Airlines. Looking at Airbnb, the next line over, similar trend. Um, it was reasonable prior to COVID and then there was a huge drop. However, the difference with Airbnb was that after April and May, there was a significant uptick in keyword searches and traffic to the Airbnb website. And the reason was people were getting tired of being locked down in their own home and they wanted to get out, but they still needed to socially distance and being in someone else's house for a period of time, renting that uh, was a viable resource. And then there was a third trend here. 
And this is where it gets really interesting. Recreational vehicles, similar before COVID, it was okay. You know, it had some bounces up and down. Then during COVID, it kind of went down and then it radically skyrocketed up. Airbnb is one concept to get out of your own home during lockdown, but a recreational vehicle allows you to socially distance while maintaining some semblance of being able to get around. And that's what people were really after. So being able to track keyword searches and see what traffic was generated for what types of um, websites was very useful here. Next. And this is the reason why it's useful. We're going to look at recreational vehicles. So we have in purple the original uh, keyword search, you know, web traffic, etc. Prior to COVID, uh, you know, the wholesale RV shipments, which is the yellow line, uh, had been doing very well, and then it dropped dramatically in COVID, just like everything else did. But then it started to go back up really fast. Um, people were buying them left and right. And if you look closely, there is a one to two month lead time or offset between the keyword searches and the actual sales or shipment of the RV. So it tracks very well. Prior to that COVID incident, there was very little correlation, but what it, the data suggests is that when we had a very unique situation and people were desperate, keyword searches and being able to see that online outside of the chemical and ingredient industry you could actually predict what the sales would be, which would help you with short term forecasting and also tell you that you need to get a digital marketing campaign out there very fast to make sure that your landing page is the one that people go to. Next. Now we'll move to Google search trends example within our own chemical and ingredient industry. Here, if we look at hand sanitizer searches from March to April to May, you know, we saw a huge spike and it was relatively high and then it dropped down. That's in blue, keyword searches, website traffic. Now we're going to show actual ChemPoint sales of thickener that we sell into hand sanitizers. And if you look closely, we saw with a one to two month lag or offset, um, it trended perfectly with the keyword searches through Google and Bing. So there is a correlation in certain circumstances that allows you to predict so that you could do short term demand planning, but also tells your marketing group, get the digital campaign out the door now because people are on this and we need to make sure that our link, our brand is first in any Google search. Next. And then finally, competitive intelligence, and this is just a very interesting one. It's non industry related, but McDonald's versus Burger King. We took a look at some data here um, and keyword searches that were trending in recent times between McDonald's and Burger King. And the reason that we're classifying this as competitive intelligence is the keywords that were used for McDonald's happened to be around Travis Scott and then Cactus Jack and Monopoly. So McDonald's business model was actually focused on, you know, utilizing celebrities um, for endorsements and then games to pull people in, whereas Burger King, the queries that were coming in for keywords were about discounts, coupons, five for four dollars, etc. Just looking at keyword searches, because we know nothing about the fast food industry, you are, we are able to figure out what are the differentiated business models between these two giant companies. We're not going to show any examples with the chemical and ingredient industry because we don't want to highlight any particular supplier or customer, but the same type of procedure here or the same type of approach does hold true within our industry. Next, sales enablement. And we're going to ask you which sales enablement tools are used in your business. And I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to pull your phones out and give some answers. Okay, are you ready to move on, Mark? So which sales enablement tools are you using?
We have a whole variety here of pricing, uh, pricing, cross-sell, Google Analytics, Magic 8-Ball, the loudest person is right. Uh, that's my favorite right there. <laughs> I am very familiar with that one. <laughs> so next slide, please. We're going to go down through a couple of sales enablement tools uh, that Kenpoint uses just to highlight an example. These are based on third party applications, but the IT and analytical group uh, with Lee and Jeff have done a lot of modification in house. And I will be upfront with you that a lot of these, in fact, all of these do incorporate machine learning. And that's a key and critical part of the wave of the future in digital versus the way things were done in the past. So order pattern alerts. I mean, historically coming from the Cam go manufacturing base myself, the salespeople would have to go into SAP or whatever ERP system was used in order to extract the data, or maybe it was extracted for them and sent via Excel spreadsheet. But either way, they would get a spreadsheet and they have to kind of ballpark, is my customer on track or is there an issue here? You can automate a system to do this for you and make it very easy. And if you incorporate machine learning into it, it's actually very effective as well. So customer churn, obviously customers come, customers go, but hopefully a customer, if you find out or recognize that they're on their way out, maybe you can ward that off and stop that process, you know, maybe a lower price or something like that. So there is a process or an app that many apps that can be used for this. Uh, we utilize Power BI internally, um, which is integrated within our ERP system. And with a machine learning component to it, it will go product by product, customer by customer. It will look at the historical order pattern for those. It will generate through machine learning what is the predicted next invoice and a short term forecast. And if that gets missed, it will automatically update or send it out as a report to the respective salespeople so that they can follow up. So it will classify things as healthy or at risk. Those are the ones the salespeople should reach out immediately or our customers churned and already gone. So instead of forcing the salespeople to do this themselves or do it via Excel, it makes life very easy for a salesperson, saves them a lot of time they can automatically see. Next. But as we talked about, it's machine learning. So what we try to incorporate into there is some feedback. And that's going to be very important here for the product recommendation. Um, recommended not next product. Cross sell was one of the things in the results for the survey question. And absolutely, what we have found is cross selling is a very valuable component to maximizing our growth. So if a customer is buying a particular product for a particular application, maybe certain other products could be utilized as well. So we have developed a, an application that utilizes AI to evaluate customer by customer, product by product, and say, hey, you know, the customer is buying a particular product and it'll send out to the salesperson without forcing them to do a lot of the behind the scenes work to figure it out. It will tell them, hey, reach out to your customer. Maybe this stuff from another, you know, industry or something like that could also be utilized by that customer. <clears throat> Next. And this one especially, the feedback into the system because it is machine learning is very critical. Otherwise, the machine has to try to learn on itself and that just makes, uh, it increases complexity. So here we've added a new component to the cross-selling tool that we allow the salespeople to give feedback to the machine itself. Hey, was your rating helpful? Was it not? What are the comments? And on that note, over time, the machine can better pick up what cross-selling recommendations were the most effective. Next. And here, pricing, just very simply, in my background, it was all download the data into an Excel spreadsheet, trying to analyze. Are you trying to go for maximum price, the highest price possible, or are you trying to maximize volume? The reality is, is that you're looking to balance price and volume in order to optimize overall profitability. But why do that in an Excel spreadsheet by manually massaging the data? Why even try to set up some type of program within an Excel spreadsheet when there are third party apps that can be adapted with machine learning um, in order to do that for you automatically? These apps are integrated into the CRM and ERP. They look at competitive threats that are in the system as well, and they generate recommendations to give you optimal pricing or optimized pricing tiers. Forecasting. 
This is our last section here where we talk about how analytics can be incorporated into uh, your business processes and we'll break this down into two parts. The short to medium term forecasting, which everyone is familiar with for production planning. And from a supplier perspective, production planning is everything. Otherwise, you run into inventory issues or you're shorting customers and we all know how that goes. However, with the increased usage of digital, um, the increased data that Mark talked about, long range forecasting, um, what is possible out there to make correlations, to develop future marketing plans or optimize your product pipeline and make better informed business decisions? Next. So demand planning, uh, just very quickly. There are software tools out there such as Legility. Um, Chempoint uses this and I am aware that some chemical manufacturers are using this as well. The important takeaway here is, is that other chemical manufacturers and customers historically look at data downloaded in an Excel spreadsheet and do their best guess as to what the forecast is going to be on the future. These third party apps, which do incorporate machine learning, utilize the historic data, but they refine the accuracy of their sales forecasting by looking at it and saying, well, our forecast back then was this based on that data as we've gotten more data how accurate can we improve our forecast moving forward and it will continue to learn um, the chart that you're looking here is the point of sale and the amount of sale throughout and the country so it happens on a geographical basis and what it does is it radically improves your capability to have optimized inventory and safety stocks available Next. And here we're going to talk about external indicators. Which external indicators do you rely on for to predict future outlooks? And I will give you 30 seconds. OK. Mark. Yeah, Sean, due, to the, due to the delay, there's uh, a little slow for the results to come in, but we've okay. got a handful. Um, it's just a little slower to come in. All right. Um, wow. On the far left, ACC chemical activity barometer. That's an interesting one. However, the purchasing managers index, the S&P 500, consumer confidence, um, the one that seems to win is on the far right, the unemployment rate at 40%. So what we've done is not focused on any particular one, but the next slide, please. We've looked at many of these. Now, you're looking at six charts here, and this is actual ChemPoint data from a personal care product. Um, we're looking starting from top left, Dow Jones Industrial Average, down to the lower right, Producer Price Index. We're not trying to explain that a particular personal care product correlates really well. I mean, the most interesting one is the middle chart on the right, where this particular personal care product happened to have the best correlation with U.S. existing home sales. And we're scratching our heads on that one. But the point that we're trying to make here is, is that in the past, by trying to go out, you might hire an intern to gather the external data from wherever they could find it and then extract from your SAP system or whatever you're using internal sales data and to generate these charts manually. Well, in the world of digital as we have it today, that's no longer necessary. Google. Google is the largest data warehouse of everything in the world, and Google Trends has all of the index data available, and not just index data, but you want to look up where the COVID hotspots are on a daily basis. You want to look up what the web traffic is for United Airlines, you know, as we showed earlier. You can automate this entire process, and here we're showing, you know, different indexes that are available in North America but you could go to COVID hotspots, the unemployment rate. You could actually look at, you know, average cost of living. You could look at anything you want to. And the point is, is that you can more often than not find that external data on a site like Google Trends. There are applications out there that you can modify and incorporate machine learning to automatically do all of this for you and update it on a daily basis in just a matter of hours. It can go and optimize and find out what the best correlation is over time, help you make that prediction. 
You can incorporate machine learning or even advanced AI into the system. And this is the future. So we talked about short term forecasting, but what we're really looking here is long term forecasting. And in 2020, it became very important because now we have to also incorporate what was the impact of COVID on all of this. So the takeaway again is you can automate this process, incorporate artificial intelligence and squeeze out in an hour what it used to take an intern or a marketing manager to six months to do. And the amount of data that is available externally as Mark talked about in terms of exabytes, it's available. Next. And finally, we're gonna wrap up here with the return on investment and best practices. So the return on investment, you're hiring people, you're going to hire a team, they're not going to magically bring ROI. Um, you're going to have to go through organizational change, drive some culture change in order to get people to buy into this at all levels of the business. Next. There is um, an article out there. It was by Nucleus Research. And just to summarize on the far left, they analyzed it and said that overall within industry, for every dollar spent, you had a return of $13. So it was a 1300% return on investment if you did your data analytics effectively. And they measured five ways, which was the impact on cost, competitive edge, speed to value, team efficiency and the effect on the revenue. We won't get into all of these today, but you can figure that out that, yeah, if you can improve on each and every one, you're going to see a 1300% return on investment. Next. Here's a tool to help you with ROI. Specifically, ChemPoint uses Visible, um, which is integrated or connected to our CRM and ERP systems. Uh, there's an AI component to it and it allows us to figure out the ROI on individual marketing campaigns. So in the digital marketing webinar of seven weeks ago, we talked about the different approaches. Everyone's familiar with email, then there's display, web referral, um, you know, search engine optimization, et cetera. Here we have limited it to display and paid searches, which is pay-per-click. Um, but it goes automatically. We don't have people feed into the system. It's automatically integrated to look into our system and figure out what was the cost associated with those particular marketing programs. That's coming from the ERP system. Then it integrates into the CRM system automatically to figure out what opportunities were associated with each of those programs because all of this data is available and all you have to do is bring it together from the opportunities, where did it go from there? What was the return on those individual investments? That helps you refine your marketing campaigns in the future. Next. So finally, we're going to wrap this up here talking about intent-based marketing. And I take you back to Mark's example of Target, figuring out that a certain young teenage lady was actually pregnant and was sending her coupons. How they did that was a process called intent-based marketing um, within the chemical ingredient industries. Just to give you an example of that it is possible in a B2B context, we did intent-based marketing as well. And based on that, we know that there are over 150 com companies in the chemical and ingredient industry that are right now today exploring an investment in data analytics software. And we can figure out who they are. That information is available online and you can do that with an intent based marketing application. Next. So some key takeaways. Number one is speed of response. The whole data analytics and the automation and machine learning is designed to give speed of response. If you're not getting it done faster, you're doing it wrong. Utilization of third party services. Don't think you're going to hire programmers and do all of this in house. The programmers that you hire are going to modify the third party services effectively and tie them together for you. It requires significant creativity and critical thinking on their part, and it also requires the different functional groups to give input as to what types of data they need. In terms of don'ts, absolutely. Number one, do not sit on your data and do nothing with it. It's being generated. It's probably being collected. Monetize it. And then implement. do not implement tools that don't support the overall strategy. Next. And that takes us to the end of this session. Open it yeah, up. Yeah, for thanks, Sean.
Um, uh, we, will we will dive, dive into uh, Q&A uh, now. now. Uh, uh, thanks for all that, uh, those details and information. Um, really exciting stuff. It's, it's pretty amazing what can be done with data. Um, data obviously is a, a fast growing field and um, there's more and more um, applications that can be used with data. So uh, Lee and Jeff, um, I'm going to put you guys on the spot. We have a, a few questions coming in. Some are online, some are offline. Um, the first one that I'd like to ask, um, uh, Lee, if you don't mind, um, most companies analyze their financial data, but often overlook the importance of operational and customer data. Would you say one area is more important for success or are they all equally important? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Mark, in regards to importance of financial, operational, customer data. In my opinion, I would treat all areas equally. Each uh, department has its, its importance in the organization, and depending on how you have your data analytics strategy set up, you can provide opportunities to boost your financial performance, improve your customer experience journey, as well as streamline your operations. It really depends also on what is your organization's focus in prioritizes in these areas. OK, thanks, Lee. Um, maybe stay with us here. There's another question. Um, what is the best way to implement uh, a type of data driven mindset in an organization? And maybe that's more specific to um, culture. Um, you've obviously worked in the, the data industry for a long time in data analytics. Um, not just you know specific at Chempoint, but in a number of or a number of other companies and industries. Um, what's the best way to to get that mindset shift to make sure that data process or data program is implemented successfully? Yeah. So based on my experience, there's many ways to get that data driven mindset shift in an organization. The first thing is it starts off with having a data driven culture. You want to get your entire organization to be obsessed with data, to rely upon data and analytics to make data-driven decisions. I think historically many companies, um, they rely upon their employees and analysts to use trusty Excel spreadsheets and make what I'll call human-defined uh, decisions instead of relying upon the data. And so if you, can, if you can make that transition to leveraging tools like artificial intelligence, machine learning, a predictive analytics that will really help prove the value and help you gain success in the area of analytics and data. OK, yeah, thanks. Lee. Obviously, it, it does take a, an organization and really a, a top down um, culture shift to really make sure that it takes hold. Um, can you comment a little bit more about the investment? The question came in about what what investment is needed? Um, obviously, there's a there's a cultural component it needs to be you know deeply ingrained in um, any organization. But especially especially if you're looking at third party analytic tools, can you give us some kind of ballpark figures of you know what kind of investment could be required, whether it's upfront capital expenses or maybe ongoing investment? Yeah. So as far as investment in third party tools and resources. Uh, it's amazing today, a company, small or large, you can actually get started today with zero dollar investment. There are platforms out there, as uh, Sean highlighted, such as Microsoft Power BI, um, there's Tableau, other platforms. You and your team, you can download these tools and get started right away, and there's zero cost. However, to make it a tool that can be used by your entire enterprise, that's where you have um, some costs, uh, depending on the size and features. Um, but then, of course, you also need to look at what's the human capital required to support these. At a minimum, I would suggest leveraging your IT team and or financial teams to pick up these tools and provide the analytical data to your organization. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, all right, we have a handful more uh, coming in now. Um, we have another question. What are the best ways to use data to identify new opportunities? Um, whether it's you know new markets for a current product or new products for current customers. Um, 
better yet, a new product altogether for a new product. Any any insights on the tools that can be used to um, understand market opportunities better? Yeah, there definitely are a lot of tools, and I think this is where uh, data analysis and predictive and machine learning comes to play. Uh, so recently, we we're doing an analysis of the last several months of keyword searches on Google at Campoint. And in addition to hand sanitizers and thickeners, we saw a big uptick in alternative uh, meats, such as plant-based um, burgers and things like that. And so if we were to do keyword searches and analyses, we would see that there is a significant uptick in plant-based food, and then we could then uh, apply other demographics on there, such as where in the country or the world are we seeing this, and then we could drill down deeper and to see what kind of products are, are being served in those areas, what's the market, um, and do a bunch of other competitive intelligence that Sean had described. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to improve your go-to market strategy with data analytics. Yeah, I, I would agree. A lot of the tools that we talked about prior um, are, are ways to identify those new markets and new products. Um, we have a question that came in about search engine optimization. Um, you know, I, I think search engine optimization and, and the question specifically is what is the most effective way to boost SEO? Um, we, we addressed a lot of that in the previous webinar talking about uh, digital marketing. Um, but but to kind of to summarize a bit and, you know, Lee, feel free to chime in um, or Jeff. Um, essentially, it's, it's putting out a lot of content and having um, a long history of online content um, and it, it, it being relevant. And it, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, Google's somewhat um, secretive in, in their algorithms, um, but there's a lot of different methods. Um, Lee, I don't know if you wanna, you know, chime in. I'm gonna actually let Jeff uh, address this one. Yeah, sure. So um, some of the strategies that we use are obviously keeping in keeping an eye on our website um, from a technical perspective. So we have a lot of monitoring around our uh, around our properties, and um, so that we can ensure that the website is fast and um, and uh, online and all of that at, at all times because those are super important for uh, SEO. Um, and then and then like uh, like Mark said keeping an eye on trends to put out content to, um, uh, you know, to write new content and, and boost our, boost our visibility for, for high, uh, high volume keywords, um, our, our main strategies. And then obviously putting out content for all of our products so that we always have, um, something show up when, uh, when someone searches for a product. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question that's coming in. I think it's really more specific to um, culture, um, and I'll I'll take a stab at it. And actually, Rick, if you're still on, maybe you can um, add a couple comments here as well. But the question is, what activities are required of my sales force to feed data into the machine? Uh, that's a great question because that's that's key to a lot of this data. I mean, obviously, there's lots of different sources of data. Um, you know, I, I think we referred to this type of data as more more transactional into your CRM and ERP. And for me, this is just very, very cultural. It, it requires um, um, CRM to really be a, a backbone of your of your culture, of your infrastructure, and it needs to be able to be a tool that can have value for your sales team and your customer service team. Um, so that they find value in it, not just to push information so that someone else finds value in it. They need to find value in it themselves. Um, Rick, I don't know if you want to add any comments. No, I, th I think you said it pretty well. For, for us, it starts at the top. Uh, you know, our everything that we do, our guiding principles, et cetera, have to focus on data. And we've been very clear that uh, data is a key priority for us as a business. It's easy in sales to look only at the margin numbers versus capturing data. Um, and maybe just to add on a little bit is, is you have two methodologies. So at Kempoint, the CRM, there's really no opting out for the sales force. You have to use the CRM 
to do your job every day. And in doing the, using the CRM, you're inherently creating data that is useful for the marketing team, for the rest of the business to use. The, you know, the second part of that is actually showing the sales team that by adding that information into the CRM, it makes their job easier and their life easier, right? Either it, it provides new cross-sell opportunities, it uh, identifies new opportunities within their market space, et cetera. So I think you kind of have to go two two prong approach is don't really allow an opt out option for your CRM because that's the point of data for your sales force. Yeah. And then I'll just quickly add on to that. Uh, if you want to find a, a creative way to encourage increased adoption of data into your systems, think about doing some kind of um, competitions. We've done competitions in the past, such as the number of um, contacts or cross sales or activities entered into the CRM, the person or team with the highest, they can get some small monetary award, but just be creative about it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, obviously you got to incentivize the team um, in, in various ways. Um, Lee or Jeff, this might be a question for, for one of you. Uh, is there such a thing as too much data? Like what happens with too much data? How can you effectively filter out the bad data so that it becomes, um, so that business decisions are sound? Is there is there such a thing as too much data that just creates noise and how do you filter it out? Yeah, I'll, I'll address this one, Jeff. Feel free to, to add in. Um, so there definitely is scenarios all the time we encounter, even at a camp point where there's too much data. You might have someone say, I want to have all sales for the last 10 years and I want to have all these different customer attributes and product attributes. And this is going to be a, a behemoth of a data extract. And we give it to the individual that requested it. And now it's up to that individual to go to Power BI or Excel, or whatever it is. And he or she needs to then slice through all that data. Um, it's what the customer requested, but can they make sense of it? Not really, because this is too much. And so that's where uh, teams that use machine learning and tools like Power BI, Tableau, whatever it might be, we could use these tools to pick up um, key pieces of information to drive action. Um, Jeff, do you have anything to add on to that? Uh, I would just add on uh, like the the situation where there's unstructured data, so data that, that isn't um, consumable directly by an end user. So there's a lot of sources out there that um, that will give you data in, a, in structures that aren't easily consumable in Excel or, or stuff like that. And you might need a data engineering team to, or you know, some kind of uh, software person to translate that data into a column format. Um, that happens very often as well. Um, so there might be some, uh, some translation needed. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, uh, Jeff and Lee. I know we're, we're going over here, but we're just going to take one more question if you don't mind. And um, it's regard it's regarding Amazon. Um, Amazon really is, is famous for giving different prices to different customers based on browsing and purchase history data. Um, I don't know if that's if that's obvious to everyone. I, I you know, I, I'm kind of vaguely familiar with that, but I don't know the details. So uh, obviously it's easier with a, with B2C where you've got a lot of a lot of data points, a lot of customers, and it's maybe a little bit trickier um, in the chemical and ingredient industry. But is there a way to do this within the chemical ingredient industry? Um, and and how? Um, yeah, how, how does the lack of that, that B2B data? There's not that like I mentioned, there's not that B2C where there's you know hundreds and thousands and millions of customers. There's a, a finite amount of data. And maybe this goes back to our pricing um, example and tool, but is there a way to take fewer and fewer data points and um, develop a more sophisticated pricing strategy? I don't know if there's someone who wants to jump in and take this one. <laughs> well, I think <laughs> to start off, that's a, it's a great question about what happens when you may not have sufficient data to make a decision. And so what we would probably do in this case is you want to look at what data do you have, extrapolate that with other information that you have about the product, the customer, the business, look at past and possible predictive trends, and that could help inform a strategy. 
Uh, so if we have, for example, a new customer to Kempoint, they've never purchased with us before. We want to find out all we know about this customer. What, what are their key business areas and where could we possibly grow uh, within that customer? And that could really drive a pricing strategy. Maybe yeah, just and I would just I would just add on to that uh, to to give sellers data. So obviously the pricing is largely driven by the quoting process uh, in our industry. So um, giving sellers data to kind of uh, be able to judge how much they think they should be, um, uh, you know, quoting for, um, and and then using their skills of negotiation to, you know, increase your pr pricing. And maybe I'll just add, and clearly I'm not I'm not an expert, but you you probably have more data than you think you do. Um, I think one area to look at is every time a product quote comes up, you should be capturing whether okay we we know we secured that business, but are you taking a look at everywhere where you haven't secured that opportunity? Which should be a pretty good hinge point to dive in and. Uh, I'll allow you and your team to make some decisions around, okay, we're losing 20% uh, of uh, any quote that we come up or customers are coming in seeing a price that's available on our website and aren't going any further. And so you probably have a lot more information than you think you do, but you need to be taking a look at areas where you're not winning as well as areas where you are winning. Yep, and that could be a matter of just collecting that data inside of your CRM or whatever you're using for your quoting process. Yeah. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Rick. Um, well, I know we went a little long today, uh, but we're going to wrap it up. Um, thanks for everyone for for attending. Thanks for kind of sticking with us through uh, as this went a little long. Um, hopefully, the information was was helpful and useful. And more importantly, hopefully this could be applied to your business. Um, how to make better you know, business decisions, uh, better planning through some of these data programs. Um, you know, Jeff Lee, thanks for taking the time to answer the questions. Sean, thanks for going through um, a majority of the content today. Rick, thanks for your comments as well. Um, stay tuned for our next uh, Tech Talk webinar. Um, it'll be coming uh, very shortly. Uh, we don't have all the details finalized as far as what the next one will be, but stay tuned. We'll send you more details and announcement. And as mentioned before, this uh, recording of today's event will be able to be viewed on the Kempoint YouTube channel um, shortly. So thanks again. We'll chat with everyone soon. Bye for now. Take care.